Hello, crime historians, and welcome back to another episode of a crime story podcast. I'm your host, Caitlin Lois, a graduate student in international relations who lived abroad in France for about two years. While abroad, I started hearing all of these insane crime stories that I've never heard about. As a lifelong true crime addict with the fascination of how crime affects culture and alters society, I decided to turn this obsession, research, and stories into a podcast to tell you all about relatively unknown crime stories. Today, I will be telling you the true story about the disappearance of Yasmina Dominic in 2000 and how the authorities solved her case 18 years later. There isn't a whole lot of information about this case that, in fact, I gave myself an extra week to try to find some more research without much luck. Though there isn't a lot of information about Jasmina, this case shocked both Croatia and the international press and deserves to be told. This is episode 25 of A Crime Story, Croatia's Missing Frozen Woman. Before I begin the crime story, let's first discuss a little history about Croatia and the Croatian legal system. The legal system of Croatia is a civil law system historically influenced by Austrian, Hungarian, and Yugoslav law. But during the accession of Croatia to the European Union in 2013, the legal system was almost completely harmonized with European Union law. Croatia established independence from Yugoslavia in 1991, and due to the fall of the Communist Party in Yugoslavia in the Balkan War, the majority of the Croatian population has a personal experience of the past atrocities because of the war. Croatia today is a parliamentary democracy. Croatia possesses a multi-party system based on the principle of three branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judicial. The crime rate in Croatia tends to be very low, with a homicide rate of just six cases per 100,000 people. Now, let us hop into the crime story. Yasmina was born in 1977 and grew up in the village of Povilek, northeast of the capital Zagreb, with her mother Katarina and her father Martin and her sister Simjana, who was three years older. It was reported that her father Martin was an alcoholic and was prone to violence, as well as borrowing money from his extended family. According to the extended family, the Dominic family held many secrets. Unfortunately, I could not find out much about Yasmina's personality, except that she was a great student and an amazing athlete. Yasmina was enrolled in the Faculty of Political Science in Zagreb in the academic year of 1996 to 1997. The following year, she changed from a full-time student to a part-time status and, and discontinued her studies in September of 1999. She could have quit college due to money issues, but she came from a, from a relatively wealthy family, so this is only really considered a rumor from her uncle. It's not really known who she hung out with while she was in college. The beginning of this crime story begins on February 16th, 2018. The patriarch of the Dominic family, Martin, had died in 2013, and his daughter, Simjana, was living in his home. His elderly wife was still alive, but his younger daughter, Yasmina, had not been seen in 18 years. Though Yasmina had not been seen since the year 2000, she was only reported missing in 2005. However, from 2000 to 2005, one person did have contact with Yasmina, her sister Sminyana. She told family members details that indicated that Yasmina was alive and well, but that she did not want to talk to her parents or extended family. Simeone stated that Yasmina had a French boyfriend and that she planned to go work on a ship and then went to go live in Paris with her boyfriend and that they would talk to each other every so often. Once in 2004 or 2005, Simeone came to a neighbor to borrow a quilt because Yasmina had come home with her boyfriend. When the neighbor later asked if Yasmina was home, Smiliana answered that she arrived on Saturday night, but she already left on Sunday morning. It was also recalled that Simeona and her husband, Ivan Sarnek, went for vacation in Budapest with friends. On the trip, Simeona's friend saw her carrying Yasmina's ID, and when he asked why, she replied, Well, we are similar. 
when communication between the sisters ended in 2005 and Katerina found Yasmina's personal documents in her bedroom, which had expired in 2003, Katerina, Yasmina's mother, decided to go to the police and officially report her daughter as missing. Relatives resented Katerina for so long to report Yasmina's disappearance that it definitely caused a rift in the family. One of the girl's uncles even hired a sidekick who told him that Yasmina had been hit on the head with a blunt object. Since the report of Yasmina's disappearance, the police had occasionally gone to their village to check for any news about Yasmina. Her phone book was searched and no number found that would have stand out to be suspicious. As there was no evidence that a crime had been committed, the police apparently did not make much effort to investigate the whereabouts of Yasmina. The police said that Simeana told them that Yasmina was living in France, but I could not find any evidence that the police reached out to French authorities to confirm this. Simeana even offered to be polygraphed twice, which for all my crime historians out there, never offered to be polygraphed or never be polygraphed without a subpoena. But Samina could not be polygraphed because of a health condition at the time and she would just cough or whatnot. Samina was diagnosed by a psychiatric clinic with a personality disorder with the predominance of dissocial and narcissistic characteristics. It's not clear what year this diagnosis came about, but there were definitely signs. In high school, Smiana got an internship to be an elementary teacher's aide. When she arrived at the school, they would not let her start because she didn't have a referral certificate from her high school. She said that she didn't have enough time to get the referral, and this is when the school discovered that Simiana had not attended the school since the third grade. Her parents were shocked by this news because they said she was dropped off at school every day. Simiana also liked to gamble, but a big doozy was in June of 2016 when Simiana was found guilty of false reporting because in 2014, she told a police department that she was attacked by three Roma men who stole the equivalent of 500 US dollar earrings from her. But this never happened. A Croatian psychologist said that people with this type of personality disorder are the most common perpetrators of aggressive acts and violence. Their desires and intentions to be satisfied immediately without delay and regardless of consequences. People with dissocial personality disorder as diagnosed as Simiana very often act aggressively. It is an outbreak of repressed aggression in that they have a lack of emotions. Such persons do not experience a sense of guilt and they rationalize their behavior. Despite her disorder, Samina and her husband had three children which she adored. This brings us back to the date of February 16th, 2018, that due to a power outage, a freezer on the ground floor of Sminiana's home started to smell. The freezer was manufactured in 1987, but had not been used by her family for years, so they decided that, that it just wasn't worth it to keep the freezer. Simiana's daughter, Katerina, who was named after her grandmother, and her boyfriend were tasked with cleaning out the freezer. First, they noticed bags of food from the year 2000. Then they say they saw female genitalia and legs, and they immediately called the police. When the police arrived at the scene, they noticed the freezer chest in the hallway of the house under the stairs were bags of frozen peas, fruits, vegetables, strawberries with dates from June 1st to June 9th, 2000. In addition, there were bags of carrots and fish in the chest of the body. The body was covered with a blue-green-white duvet cover with a floral pattern in which the other part of the body was wrapped and there were traces of blood on it. The head of the victim was again wrapped in a black nylon bag tied around her neck with a nylon stocking. There was a tablecloth under the body and each leg was wrapped in a black nylon bag and additionally wrapped it with a nylon sock and then tied everything in a knot again. Beneath the body in the freezer were also bags of frozen offal, bags of frozen cherries, which were placed in the chest on June 6, 2000 in two bowls of frozen food and a bag of frozen tomatoes. 
leading to the conclusion that the body was placed in the freezer from June 6th to the 9th of the year 2000, 18 years before. It didn't take long for the police to discover that the body in the freezer was that of 23-year-old Yasmina Dominic. She was killed with five strong blows to the head, most likely in her sleep, with an axe eye or some other object, in that she was pushed into the freezer from her chest. Forensic technicians photographed everything and arrested Smyana the day after the body was found. An extensive investigation was launched and completed with physical and circumstantial evidence concluding that Smyana killed her sister Yasmina. The news of the discovery of the body 18 years after the report of the disappearance spread around the world and media outlets reporting about the evil sister in the quiet Croatian town. Four days later, Yasmina was properly buried in a local cemetery in a white coffin specially made for her because of the cramped position of which she was found in. The trial started in the summer of 2020, and boy, this was a dramatic trial mainly due to the nature of the charges and the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course they had to use masks in trial, and Simiana liked to demonstrate how hard it was for her to wear a mask, but I guess it wasn't that hard for her to kill her sister. Anyway, the defense argued that there wasn't enough evidence for Simiana to be the killer and noted that the house that where Yasmina's body was found belonged to her father until his death and he lived there until 2013. Though never explicitly said, she was blaming her father for the murder. Though Martin wasn't the best guy as we've established later, his family testified that he was torn up about Yasmina's disappearance and would often say that, quote, I just need to know where Yasmina is and see her. The prosecution's case, in my opinion, was a slam dunk. The circumstantial evidence was there. It was found in Simiana's house. The motive was said to be jealousy that Samina had for Yasmina, whose life was on an upward trajectory, whereas hers was not. The most damning for Simiana's guilt was the physical evidence. Smyana's fingerprints were all over the food stored along with her sister's clothing and a piece of a rubber glove that Samina used fell off in between the blankets and Yasmina's body. Not to mention that there was her DNA all over the blankets and the food. On June 30th, 2020, Samina Snarnik was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison for a homicide and concealment of the body. As of March 2021, she has not appealed her conviction. This completes the 25th episode of A Crime Story. What do you think about this case? Do you think that Smin Yan was guilty? Can you believe that she let her daughter find the body of her aunt? You can comment on a crime story Instagram at a crime story pod, where I will be posting images of today's story. Or you can comment on a crime story podcast on Facebook or at a crime story pod on Twitter, or even comment and see additional photos on a crime story podcast on YouTube. I'm also on TikTok under the name a crime story podcast. My website is a crime story podcast.com where you can listen to the podcast as well as read a transcript of today's story underneath the blog tab. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please leave a review of the podcast, it helps others find it. Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you next time on March 24th, where I will be covering a case from India. You won't want to miss it. A Crime Story is created, hosted, researched, written, and edited by me, Kaylin Lois. Sources for today's episode can be found on my website, acrimestorypodcast.com. The artwork for the show is created by Sabrina Smith. Theme music is by Ross Bajan. Additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to A Crime Story. Stay safe at home and abroad.